Hello and welcome back to Let's Code Physics. Last time we worked with our projectile motion code, uh, we were able to set up a drag force um, that creates some interesting behavior. Um, the drag force is always going to be parallel to the opposite direction of the ball's velocity. And actually this velocity is really the velocity of the ball relative to the wind. We added in our relative wind last time, so you can just replace this from being vol ball velocity to being uh, a relative velocity of the ball compared to the air. There's one other type of force that the ball might get from the air, and that's a lift force. Um, so for example, if this thing had some kind of curvature to it, or if it's spinning, um, or just depending on the angle it's traveling at, it can generate a lift force in the air. Um, the lift force, we usually think of it as pointing upward because it, um, you know, obviously if you're in an airplane, you want it to be pointing upward to, uh, to, to lift your airplane up. But if you have a spoiler on a car, you basically have a wing that's upside down that gives you a downward lift. I guess that would be more appropriately called a press. Um, but the lift force doesn't necessarily point directly up or directly down. It points perpendicular to the direction of the relative wind velocity. Um, so our lift force, in this case, force of lift, is going to be perpendicular to V. Um, so in other words, if, if, the, if the velocity is pointing in, up and to the right, then the lift force points up but to the left. Um, so it does produce a little bit of uh, a force against the motion of the um, of the object, but most of it usually ends up being going up uh, this way. Um, so what we need to do, if we're going to model a projectile with a lift force, we need to generate a force that's perpendicular to the velocity. So getting a, a force that was uh, uh, anti-parallel to the velocity was pretty easy. We just took this RV hat um, and just took it as the, uh, the velocity minus the wind velocity. And then here we took it as a, we added a negative onto it for the drag force. To get something perpendicular though, we need to take the cross product. So we need to take uh, RV, what shall we call this? Um, hat perp maybe for perpendicular. So what we need to do here is we need to take our RV hat and then we need to cross it. <clears throat> oh, and actually you just take cross of one vector with another. Okay, good to know. Uh, so we just take cross product of the RV hat with, and uh, we need another vector to set up this uh, perpendicular motion. What we'll do for now is uh, we'll set that second vector to be the vector that comes out of the screen here. So in Python, that's going to be uh, y hat. Uh, or excuse me, it's going to be Z hat. Excuse me, because Py V Python is programmed with the um, with the Z axis coming out of the screen. Um, and so what we can do is we can take this V, cross it with the Z hat coming out of the screen, and we'll get this vector pointing this way. Actually, I'm, you can't see me as I don't have my camera on, but I'm doing the right hand rule. Actually, we need to take it the other way, don't we? We need to take a Z hat cross V, because then you would curl, you would point your fingers uh, of your right hand in the direction coming out of the screen. You would curl them this way, and then your thumb would be pointing up in, uh, in the lift direction. So we actually need to have Z hat cross V. Um, so I need to make the vector Z hat. I don't know that vPython already has that programmed in, so we'll just give that vector 0, 0, 1. So that is the vector z hat, the vector pointing out of the screen. We're going to cross that with r hat. All right, z hat cross v. I'm just doing the right hand rule one more time. Okay, yeah, that works. Um, <clears throat> and so that, that gives me the direction of my lift force. Now I need to set up the equation for the lift force. Uh, the equation for the lift force is nearly identical to that for the drag force. Um, we're going to call it lift force here. It, uh, it also has a half and an air density. Instead of the drag coefficient, it has lift coefficient. Um, it also takes in the projectile's area, so you can change the size of this thing and have it get a different lift and a different drag. Um, and then here I need the magnitude of the relative wind velocity. There we go. And then to get the direction, now we just put in, uh, what do we call it? RV hat underscore perp. Okay, underscore perp. 
And so now this lift force is going to point perpendicular to the direction of travel. So we're going to get a little bit of a lift. We should see our uh, projectile paths um, go a little bit longer than before. Um, let's do this. Where did I define drag coefficient? I find that over here. So let's define a lift coefficient. Uh, let's make it smaller than drag. Actually, let's set it up to be zero first just to make sure we don't get anything strange in the behavior. And I suppose I also need to actually add that force to the total force if it's going to do anything, don't I? Lift force. There we go. And let's scroll back up. This is the part I want to be able to change is the lift coefficient later. All right, let's run this. We should get what we got. Did everything we got last time? Okay, so again, we get this uh, sort of asymmetric, uh, not quite parabolic path, a, a distorted parabolic path is probably the, be the best way to put it because you get a broader opening here than you do over here because of the effect of the drag. Um, yeah, that looks about right. Um, let's try out our lift force. Oh, I reset the wind velocity vector to zero, so we'll give that a try in a little bit. Um, let's try out our lift coefficient. Let's try a lift coefficient of one. Um, for reference, our farthest point was getting out uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. So it's getting out to about x equals twelve. Um, so let's try it now with our lift. With our lift, we should in principle be staying up in the air longer, and lo and behold, we do. So now we're even more distorted. Oh, I should have, uh, I should have measured the altitude they went to as well. So our farthest one now is getting out to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13. We got an extra bar of measurement out of that. Uh, but you also notice we're getting some pretty different results here. Ooh, we even get a little loop-de-loop -loop there. That's kind of cool. Um, and this again is without the um, this is without any wind turned on. This is the kind of results we were getting with a with an ambient wind turned on. So that's pretty cool. Um, let's see how high did we get here? We went one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Uh, up to 12. So we got 13 and 12 there. Um, let's double our lift coefficient and see what we get. Oh, that is cool. See, this is the kind of thing I love to get is, you know, it's nice to compare the numbers, but when you get something that's qualitatively different, that's what we like to see in physics. Because before, right, this thing was, this thing was a distorted parabola, but it was definitely concave down. Now we're getting concave up at the beginning and then concave down. So that means somewhere in the middle, we've got an inflection point. And that's the kind of cool, um, oh, this one almost loop-de-looped -looped back to where it started. That's cool. That means there's, there's going to be some magic angle where it'll end up back where it started. That's kind of cool. This is the kind of thing we look for. You know, looking for the changes in the numbers is interesting, but looking for qualitatively different behavior, that's ultimately what you want to find in a physics study. Um, so let's try it. Let's count these again. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. 13 and a half, so we get a little bit on there. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Okay, we're still getting about the same height. Um, I suppose that I suppose that makes sense. Like for these, they're shooting straight up. The lift is going to be acting back this way. Actually, I should probably double check this um, <clears throat> this lift vector just to make sure that it is uh, producing the, the the right direction that I'm expecting. Um, let's see, what would be a, a good way to check that? Uh, let's see, if I come down here. Um, where do I keep track of the time? The time here, okay, let's say in the first frame, let's say I were to, let's say I print this R hat, RV hat perp. Um, so let's print, please, um, RV hat, oh, excuse me, RV hat, comma, RV hat underscore perp. Um, just in the case of if time equals zero. There we go. Just to just as a little sanity check to make sure that um, we're getting the correct type of results that we expect. Okay, so this is pointing up. This is pointing mostly to the right and slightly up, and then this is pointing to slightly to the left and mostly up. 
just like I would, yeah, yeah, just like I would expect a perpendicular vector to do. In fact, if I take the dot product of those two, um, I should get zero because it would be this thing times this thing plus this thing times this thing, and those are the same thing apart from a minus sign. Um, so looking at my vector here, it looks like my perpendicular calculation is working. All right. Okay, don't need that diagnostic anymore. It's always nice to check. Um, you know, I could have it... Oh, you know what I could do? Uh, this might be a fun way to end this video would be to add in um, the vectors to, to sort of show live the velocity and the force vectors. Why don't we do that? Let's have that be the last thing we do in this video. Um, and that'll actually be a good conclusion to our series, I think, because uh, I need to take a break from this for summer. Um, I will post updates as I'm able to, but you can expect to see uh, more regular videos back again in the fall. Um, so let's make a few arrows here. So let's do this. Let's say uh, we have a velocity vector. It's going to be an arrow. <clears throat> And arrows need a position of the projectile dot position. Um, it needs a color of, let's go with color dot red. Oh, and I need an axis. Um, axis is equal to projectile dot, oh, we don't have projectile dot velocity yet. Okay, that's fine. That just means we'll move this down here, let's see, so projectile.area, um, do, 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 yeah, projectile.velocity, here we go. Paste, the velvec equals this. Cool, that should be all I need. I'll probably need to scale this number down, but we'll, we'll animate it first and see what we need to do to change that. Um, so what I need to do, every time I update the velocity, I need to also update the velocity vectors. Uh, actually, I actually need to update its position and its axis. So here where we get to the, um, okay, so here we're done with the projectile updates. Uh, let's say vel vec dot position equals projectile dot position, because we have to update that every frame. Vel vec dot axis is equal to projectile dot velocity. There we go. Let's see how badly I messed that up. Oh, there we go. Oh, that's cool. That's cool. That is way too big, but that is cool. Oh, man. So you can see it's changing its magnitude and its direction. I should have done this the first video. That would have been more interactive, I guess. Um, okay. Let's scale that down now. Um, that wasn't too bad. Let's maybe scale it down by a factor of a half uh, projectile.velocity. And let's see, where did I find that? I find that over here, paste, F5. <clears throat> oh, that's cool. That is so cool. Um, let's, let's see, depending on how messy we want this thing to be, let's add in vectors for all of the forces that are, go that are uh, accompanying us. So let's have the um, lift vector, and let's see, we'll just copy and paste this thing. Um, position needs to be the same. Let's have the forces be in white just for a little contrast. Um, and axis needs to be the lift force. Um, let's just leave it like that for right now because um, I'll need to update its axis here. So let's do uh, lift underscore vec uh, dot axis is equal to lift underscore force. There we go. And then I'll need to, that so that way it'll only be off by on the first frame, which you can't even notice anyway. I mean, I'm sure you can if you pause the video at the right moment. And if you're doing that, um, I, 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 I thank you for your dedication to this channel. Um, let's see here. So lift vec dot position is equal to projectile dot position. There we go. And I don't need to change its axis. I already did that up here. Um, I suppose I might as well update them all in the same spot. Um, the lift force isn't changing. So it probably makes more sense to update them all in the same place. All right, does that work for me? Oh, there's the lift force. Um, cool. Uh, 
I might want to change the scaling factor for the forces, but let's put in the let's do the same thing for the drag force first. So let's copy this, paste, oops. I never know when to depend on the indentations and when not to. All right, so there we'll put that in drag, drag, drag force. Um, and of course I need to create a drag vec, which I'll do up here, copy and paste, drag. Uh, let's have that one be white as well. I suppose I could put in the, the, oh, that's cool. Oh man, that's so cool. Uh, let's change their scaling a little bit. Um, <clears throat> let's see, lift vec, just so that way they're a little bit more visible. And the relative scaling between the four, I mean, the scaling should be the same between the forces, but the forces and the velocity are measuring different quantities and they're in different units. So it doesn't matter that they're being scaled differently. And you know what, just for kicks and giggles, let's put in the gravitational force. So let's have gravitational vector dot position equals projectile dot position and grav vec dot axis is equal to gravitational force. There we go. And we are, yeah, we're calculating the, the, the weight, the gravitational force in every frame. Not that we really need to since it's a constant, but you know, if you wanted to do, say, a, a projectile that was losing mass, you could be changing its mass const, uh, each frame. Um, let's make a grab vec here. Copy, paste, nope. There we go. I want, I want pretty spacing between my blocks of code. There we go. Uh, so this needs to, oops, I don't know what I just did there. Uh, let's see, gravitational force, color white, yes. Okay, that's cool. <clears throat> so you can see what's happening. You're getting basically zero lift force as you get up to the top, right? Because your velocity is nearly, is, is, is at a minimum. I shouldn't say nearly zero, it's, it's at a minimum. But you notice you're also getting a lot more drag force at the beginning than you are at the end. And I like how the, the force vectors get frozen at the end because I haven't reset them or anything. Oh, that's so cool. Oh man, wow, that is neat. Okay, well, I think that's a good place to end it. Um, so this will be sort of the uh, the most visually appealing part of it. Um, like I mentioned earlier, um, this is going to be the last video in this series for now. Um, I'll be th trying to think up other ideas of things to throw in here, literally throwing, um, for the future. Uh, you can expect to see r videos posting regularly again in the fall, and like I said, I will uh, uh, be working on stuff off camera over summer and uh, post updates as I'm able to. So thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.